I've been a member of the Florida Legislature for the last seven years. Um, approximately five years ago, there were some alimony bills that were introduced in the legislature. Um, one of the bills eventually passed and was vetoed by the governor. And then there was another bill that was brought forth in 2015. And that was also vetoed by the governor. Two or three years ago, one version of the bill was, was uh, vetoed by Governor Scott because it was retroactive. Hardly anyone understands what retroactive means in this context, but what it means is if you've already got a judgment, if a judge has already ordered alimony, this bill goes into effect if then a modification of the alimony uh, is asked for, then this bill would apply to the old alimony award that was made under different considerations. People who already had alimony ordered wanted a bill that allowed them to have a second or fifth bite of the apple to try to get it reduced. The reform also doesn't take into account that many of us many women make an arrangement at a divorce. They give up a home or they give up financial assets for alimony, okay? It's a deal. It's I give you the house, the cars, the pension, and you're gonna give me alimony. Now you're gonna go zoom four years ahead and you're gonna backtrack on the deal? Okay, take my alimony away, but now let's renegotiate. I want the house back that I sold you for the alimony. I want the pension back that I gave up for the alimony. How do you do that? How do you renegotiate a deal? And we've given up everything in order to get alimony because maybe that was what we were advised or maybe that made sense at the time. And now you're gonna take it away. Are we able to then go back? Is there a provision to go back and us take our homes back? or take any of those things we gave up initially back, I mean, that might be a, a better alternative. The women that I'm most concerned about are the women who are older, who it's too late for them to go possibly um, either go back to work or to change careers so that they could make up money that's going to be taken away from them because the job market is moving very quickly these days in the age of uh, computers. If you've been out of the job market for just a few years, you're out of luck. And there is a lot of age discrimination. And a lot of these men, they, including men who are sitting on the committees, uh, senators and rep, representatives, have come to Tallahassee. I've watched them over the years. I've been doing this for 45 years up in the Capitol, and I've watched them. They come up here, they divorce their wives, get them, um, these young women, you know, like I say, they trade their wives of maybe 25, 30 years in for a younger model, and then they want to leave these women out in the cold. Maybe these women have never worked before. Maybe the husband didn't want their wife to work. They wanted their wife to stay home and raise the children, um, take care of the, all of the household matters while they advance in their career. And then all of a sudden, the woman's gotten older, maybe the kids are out of the house now, and they decide they want a younger wife. This happens all the time, and it happens right up here in this capital. I moved here in January of 2005, I believe it was, and then um, discovered that my former husband had had an inappropriate affair with our real estate agent, who was 15 years his junior. Uh, after about 18 months of attempting to repair the damage caused by the affair, I filed for divorce in Florida. Um, because I had been a stay-at-home mom for all those years, I was awarded permanent periodic alimony and my divorce was final in 2009. It was a little difficult after my divorce to reinvent myself uh, with a 25-year-old resume, but 
I took a job as a nanny for a two-week-old baby after my divorce and I cared for her till she was four years old and then she went to preschool and after that I struggled to find employment. As we um, assembled the press and did the press conference, uh, they were really crowding in. It was quite the hostile environment and so much so that very, and it wasn't subtle at all, I will tell you, they just kept getting closer and closer and closer and trying to follow us, really. It was, we were there to have a press conference to say, this is what we're trying to do and we want to uh, speak with the governor. Um, we ended up getting into the office area of the, the governor with the secretary and receptionist. It's not a large room and they filled it up and they crowded us and they had signs and they were yelling um, very derogatory things at uh, myself, uh, Judge Doyle, who was there, and some other women who were there who had been affected by the laws and felt like they would be adversely affected in the future. So very peaceful, you know, we just wanted to be heard. So here they are bullying and harassing um, a group of professionals and, you know, peaceful people wanting an um, opportunity to have a press conference and talk to the governor uh, about our opinion on the law and why we think he should veto it. And it was just, um, it's a very hot topic that unfortunately I think they were really dealing very emotionally. And that occurred to me at that time that there are so many women affected by this. And if that's, if that's on their other side, I mean those are their ex-husband, that's how they treat them, that they need more advocates to stand up for them because I don't blame them for being bullied and scared um, if those are the men they're dealing with when they're trying to stick up for themselves um, to get the support that they need under the laws. There was a lot of emotional, um, mental abuse, and there was a lot of, um, excuse me, a lot of physical abuse um, that he would cover up. Uh, he had been arrested for domestic violence because when I got out of line, um, that's how he dealt with me. Or if I disturbed him in watching a game or um, in any activity that he had going on, he would, he would physically abuse me. When we were in the lobby of the governor's office waiting for somebody to come answer the door, uh, the, the people there to protest our being there uh, were surrounding us and yelling and, and uh, trying to demean the women and me. I mean, they all knew I was a judge because they had heard the presentation out in the lobby uh, or that I was a retired judge. and uh, and. This one guy in particular kept uh, coming around and trying to to speak to individual women, uh, and so I got I was I moved myself back. Although I was one of the people supposed to talk to the governor up at the door, I moved myself to the back of the crowd uh, of the crowd of women, uh, and whenever he would try to approach uh, one of the women, I would just move to stand with my back to him uh, and, and between him and the woman he was trying to approach and um, and I turned just over my shoulder once I said leave, leave her alone and he said I only want to talk to her now that's a typical domestic violence uh, statement I've heard it many times in domestic violence cases and I said she doesn't want to talk to you and he said, well, I'm not touching her. And I said, but you're touching me and you do not have my permission. <laughs> and, he, and he just turned around and walked out. I mean, I didn't leave the whole place, but he, he, he made sure he was not having contact with me anymore. Uh, but that's the way they were. You know, I, I was concerned that somebody's gonna hit me in the back of the head or something. And these women, I mean, they were brave women in there uh, listening to all of this abusive chanting and yelling. Uh, and that's the kind, that's the kind of opposition that we get from the first husbands groups and the men's rights groups and the second wives groups. That's the nature of it. That I got an email and he said, I closed your checking account, closed your credit cards, canceled the lease on the house, and filed for divorce and sole custody of our daughter. I canceled your return trip. Don't come back here. No one will meet you at the airport. And I, I was devastated. I, I, 
I mean, that was my life, my husband, my daughter, my house. So I came here and I, I was homeless on the street and I slept in Green Acres, which was where I had lived, uh, on the bench in front of a Publix because it was light and I figured I would be more or less safe. But I didn't have any access to services and I heard about places in West Palm, so I came up here to where I could shower and I ate four times a week. I'd lost over a hundred pounds. My doctor asked me how I did that. I said, it's a homeless diet. You only eat Monday through Thursday if it's not a holiday. And you walk up to 12, 14 miles a day everywhere you're gonna go and you carry everything you own in a bag, you know. But approximately 12 or 13 months later, my former husband left his position as a vice president earning six figures and my alimony ceased. So I found it increasingly challenging to work full time, try to pay my bills, and I was making about $26,000 a year as a nanny, which was about average. Um, so I then set out to see if I could <clears throat> find him, and I did. I found him working for a company in St. Louis. So I sent my income withholding order to St. Louis to payroll, and I started getting my alimony back again. <clears throat> Shortly after that, he left the company again. By this time, I had filed several contempt charges against him, which were granted. Um, I have a writ of bodily attachment in court against him and several purge amounts. Um, that makes it increasingly difficult to keep your head above water, uh, especially in this economy. And trying to find another job <clears throat> after my nanny position ended was even more challenging. Um, I recently found him working in Vancouver, in Canada, and that, be that made another set of challenges because the income withholding order is not enforceable in Canada without an interjurisdictional support order, which you have to go through the court to get. So my quest to find an attorney in Canada to take my case resulted in me eventually finding an attorney that took it on contingency because my former husband owed me approximately $157,000 in arrearages. So for $500, I retained him and we got a court order for income um, being deducted from his six-figure income, which in 2015, he earned $356,000 in income to my $26,000 in income. So shortly after that happened and I was able to get my alimony back and I was caring for my mom at the time, um, helping my father with her. Um, as I mentioned, she was diagnosed with dementia so I was her nurse 24-7. Um, he left the company again. So as of last January, he owes me approximately $205,000. He left the company in Vancouver, and I'm not sure if he's where he is. I've got a case right now where the, where the woman has some psychiatric disabilities, and she's being supported in part by the state of Florida and in part by a relative who, who has some uh, means. Um, and I'm simply handling the appeal. I didn't try the case, and I'm not handling the enforcement. But the person who was awarded uh, or ordered to pay her permanent alimony is in Georgia, and he's just disappeared. He moved out of his home after the award. He hasn't paid the retroactive alimony. He hasn't paid the ongoing alimony. And uh, she's being supported again modestly, nominally, by the state of Florida um, and by her relative. but. Um, the, the person who was ordered to pay, her, her former spouse who was ordered to pay her permanent alimony has just dug his heels in and he's not paying anything at all. Most of my cases, people pay. I, I think sometimes where people don't have ties to a community or they live out of state, uh, it can create some, some difficulties. Or people with very high incomes who just simply flee the country. I've had cases where people have attempted to flee um, and have been caught doing it, haven't been able to move their assets before. 
um, but there's a lot of threats and emotion that goes along with this on both sides and it creates um, some major problems when somebody's dependent upon that alimony and isn't receiving it. There is nobody that is overseeing these courts. I filed an emergency medical motion for an urgent medical need for our son. It has been almost a year. It has not been heard yet. When one person has the funds to fight in court and all they need is an attorney that sees and, and gets on this money bandwagon, you can never get in front of a judge. The loophole seems to be that unless you're standing in that jurisdiction, you can pretty much snub your nose at the court and say, I have no money to pay her. In my last hearing, the judge said, but sir, you made $356,000 last year in income. Your bonus was $115,000. That's more than some people make in a year. How can you say you don't have the money to pay her? Well, I've lost my job, and it's just a, it's just a, a cycle that is perpetuated. Um, and I don't blame the court because they don't really have the teeth to go outside the jurisdiction. So uh, one thing um, that women ask a lot, um, well, now I've got this order and he's not going to pay. He's not paying. He stopped paying alimony, uh, what we call enforcement of alimony. Um, and this is, um, again, maybe sometimes an answer that women don't want to hear, but you, you have to take action. Um, so you have a court order. Now, it's definitely signed by the judge. Either the two of you agree to the terms or a court ordered it based on a t trial. But either way, the judge has signed it. So that is a court order that is enforceable by contempt. And that requires you, yes, to take him back to court. And I think that's the biggest barrier. Women are tired of the litigation, the emotional toll it took on them. They may not want to go back to court and, um, and maybe the expense of hiring an attorney. But um, there's no other way to do it. Um, you know, you fought that hard to get that court order and that settlement and agreement to order alimony. You're going to have to enforce it. Um, and what that means is filing a motion for contempt and going back before the judge. And then that opens a whole, you know, your attorneys are going to know the judges you're in front of and going to be able to advise you. Um, so many times men quit their job or get a new job and then they say I can no longer make the money that I did. And they say that all the time so please understand that the judges aren't going to take that at face value. Um, there is a legal burden that has to be overcome and it has to be involuntarily um, that they lost their employment and permanent um, and you know obviously through no fault of their own. And it you know what happens a lot of times is they own their own businesses and you know and I know they finagle the numbers and I know it's difficult but the only way you stand up to a bully is to stand up and to stand up again and again and again. You know everybody says love is blind and it, it really really is. I was blind. I, I was blinded to uh, the things that could go on. I, I was blinded to the fact that my ex-husband was such a good salesman that he's manipulated my daughter right out of my life. And, and I'm not the only one. Um, I've heard from many women throughout this that they've lost their kids. You think that can't happen to you? I'm living proof it can. I really am. I, I had a jewelry box that said to my best friend, my mom, uh, I got to the point that I could no longer look at it. I sent it back to her finally two years ago because you, you just can't imagine losing your kids. It, 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 I, can't, I can't grieve. I can't mourn. She's not dead. She's alive and well and having a life and I'm missing it. One day she's going to get married. One day she's going to have kids. And I'm not going to see it because of what my ex has been able to do through the way our court systems handle things.
biggest concern with this change in the alimony laws is that women who gave up the opportunity to advance a career and to really be fully self-supporting in a lifestyle that's above poverty level, they're really going to be hurt by these limitations. And by extension, their children, their families are going to suffer because these women are not going to get the amount of support that they truly need. And it, it hurts the fabric of our society. Women are really not going to be able to choose to stay at home and raise their children anymore. And at one time, we all thought there was a value in that. Um, most of us still think that there's value in that. I'm a grandmother. I would love for my daughter-in-law to be a stay-at-home mother. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want her fear that one day she may not be able to support herself and the children when they're in her care to be the deciding factor as to whether she chooses to be a stay-at-home parent when my grandchildren are young. The other real downside from a conservative fiscal perspective is we are going to create more dependence on the state. Um, these women and their children are going to require um, supplemental nutrition, uh, what we used to call food stamps, it's now called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Program benefits, and they're going to need welfare, and they're going to need Medicaid, and their wealthy fathers and husbands could have prevented that if not for this bill. We were both going to counseling together and one day the, we sat down at counseling and he handed me divorce papers. During the divorce he got the house, he got the toys, he got my daughter. I lived with my mom here and there but for the most part I was homeless. I didn't have anywhere to go. I was lost, so I was lonely, I didn't feel worthy. He had an attorney, he paid for a private attorney and I didn't know about any of it and that's how the divorce papers got served. He was able to take everything and I had no voice. My voice got taken away from me. I was reaching out for the courthouse to see if the courthouse would help me in any way um, because they have like attorneys that'll help pro bono but because I didn't have my daughter I wasn't entitled to anything. I didn't have any really good relationship with my daughter. She was young and she was mad and she was hurt. And she was full of a lot of anger. And today she understands differently. Today our relationship is different. And she gives me a lot of power to keep moving forward. I, get, I actually look up to her today. Today I just, I'm trying to better myself, better my life. I'm looking for a job right now. And my goal is to work hard, save as much money as I can for my own apartment, and just keep my life moving forward. One side effect of that is that we'll have people who aren't able to support themselves. Let's say a woman who is, is uh, 50 years old and has been married for 30 years has no ability to, to uh, earn income and has uh, paid nothing into uh, Social Security. Uh, when if, if, she, if she's 50 years old and the most alimony she can get is 20 years, then at 70, what's she going to do? The reform would directly impact us. It not only would impact my son and I, it will impact every taxpayer in the state of Florida. Because if you feel like my ex shouldn't be paying for his disabled son and helping, or his wife of 20 years, um, who's going to pay? I, I can't do it. I, I will work. I can provide some work, but I can't take care of my son full time and as of right now he does have needs. He is not independent. My goal is that he will be independent but he is not now. I will become dependent on the system for the first time in 58 years. I was independent. You can't give up your career for that many years and expect to re-enter the workforce and survive. I had a pension when I married my ex-husband. I have no pension now. I had life insurance when I married him, when I was on my own. I don't have that now. I have nothing. I, I would really like to see uh, a, a task force. I'd like to see the groups come together and, you know, really objectively, um, you know, look at all this. And, uh, you know, I think it's, 
you know, a proper empirical analysis of the situation, you know, neutral expert uh, study, um, I, I think is important. So I, I mean, that, that, that's why, I'm, you know, moving forward, I'd like to see that and it's some kind of a task force. Um, and then I don't care what side you're on, if you take that approach, uh, I mean, you really can't complain. I mean, you know, there is ample opportunity to get, you know, input from both sides. And, and then hopefully, you know, that neutral uh, perspective uh, in the mix. We need to figure out how we're going to protect people in society who would fall in the cracks, who would get food stamps, who would have to be eligible for Medicaid. It doesn't serve anyone in our community if we have people who are becoming impoverished because of the fact that they're getting divorced and it doesn't serve the the spouse on the other side also because their children are in the same oftentimes the children are living with the um, the other spouse and their children are going through these same issues so it's something that we need to look at seriously um, what I have proposed is that we start to do a study a comprehensive review of what is going on in the state with alimony, where changes need to be made. We need to really look at the matter objectively. So much of what has happened in the bills that were proposed in Tallahassee were very subjective. People just made up numbers for what's what should be considered a short marriage, what should be considered a medium length marriage, what should be considered a long marriage, and then they made up, pulled numbers out of the air for determining how much alimony you should get for each of those categories. We don't know what the impact of those numbers are gonna be. We don't know if we're gonna be putting more people into the poverty level or, you know, or if we're gonna be putting pe giving people too much excess. So we need to look at it from both sides of the issue. And we have a group in Tallahassee, uh, there's a governmental agency, OPAGA, that's purpose is to do studies. I have made several recommendations to the governor as well as the bill sponsors that let's do it now, let's do a study so we can go through and do alimony reform that's comprehensive and benefits all the parties, uh, not just one side. Well, I think the, the the largest effort of the of the bar, um, the judiciary, and the legislature should be to uh, really look at this economically, to get economists involved, to get a blue ribbon committee of people on both sides of the issue, because everyone has a story to tell, and the best way to write a fair law that will stand the test of time, because remember, this alimony law goes all the way back to when Florida was a territory. And it is a myriad of factors for the court to consider. And alimony and, and any law shouldn't simply be a rubber stamp. If people have had a loss, there should be a remedy for that loss. So alimony is simply a remedy uh, in the event that the party's marriage contract breaks down. But if, if legislatures, legislature, legislators, I don't know why that's so difficult to say, if legislators would get involved with both sides and try to craft a bill that meets everyone's interest and doesn't simply see alimony as something that is earned over time, but as something that is a uh, contract between the parties of, I promise to support you, and um, for the court to consider that economically for some reasonable period of time from the very start of that marriage and, and give marriage more uh, dignity, I think that would um, do great benefit to the families of the state of Florida and to their constituents. So I would implore the state of Florida to look at this very carefully and try to come up with something that meets everyone's interests, both payors, um, because rich payors are what have started this snowball rolling downhill and the recipients who so desperately need support because they've handicapped themselves to give their lifeblood for their family. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't think it was very, very important for women to stand together to fight for freedom from this alimony reform bill. It is terrible. You must get together, you have to elect officials who will represent you, you have to speak, you have to not be afraid to be heard. And this is coming back again next year. It's been every year for the last about five years. 
and they won't stop, so neither can we.